Hi, this is Mae Wiggins, and I'm with the Thousand Pip Club. I want to thank everybody for showing up here today um, for this class of the Thousand Pip Club. Um, we are um, new to work straight, and it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity. Start out with by getting an idea of uh, how many people on here. Can you just let me know um, by a show of hands? Um, and we'll take a look at this and see how many people are um, less than six months in the in the, the 4X. And you just excellent. We have some people. Um, and uh, how many people more than between six months and maybe a year and a half? Eighteen months. Excellent information. Okay, um, we're going to get started here. Um, just wanted to give you an idea. Thousand Pip Club really um, is a course that starts with the beginning trader all the way up um, through advanced traders. And so what we're doing here with um, FX Street is providing some baseline training. I think in a lot of cases training that people miss when they go in and start learning the Forex and learning strategies right away. Um, part of this class today is about understanding the players in the market and um, making sure that you really understand the foundation of the Forex, which is all the currencies that are involved. So I'm going to get started here. If you have questions, I'll check that from time um, to time. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to start with, obviously, uh, currencies equal equate to economies, and we're going to just talk a little bit about the players. Um, first of of course, is the um, USA, uh, which has the U.S. dollar, and of course, that's the prime world currency. It is uh, the measure. Every other currency in um, the world is basically evaluated in, in terms of what its value is against the U.S. dollar. It's um, uh, understandably in the last couple of years taken some pretty big beatings got some very heavy debt burdens, but it's continuing to be the prime currency, and it now is a, a participant in almost half of the um, uh, trades that occur in the Forex market. Um, I think they, uh, the BIS, uh, Bank of International Settlements, uh, because there's two currencies to a pair, the total equals 200%. Of that 200%, 85% of those trades um, include the U.S. dollars, and, the, and that has been the case for many years. Second one, the Eurozone um, is a participant almost 40% uh, out of that 200%. So uh, obviously it's, the, it's now, it is the world's largest economy. Um, the U.S. is the largest single economy, but uh, obviously with 17 participant states, the Eurozone is, is pretty large. It's right up there. It's the largest thing is single economy. Then we're going to Japan. Obviously, it has taken a beating, um, not just on its currency, but its um, increase uh, recently, but natural disasters, uh, the tsunami, and then the subsequent nuclear issues in Japan have really hurt the economy and forced the Bank of Japan to intervene recently. Switzerland I'm putting in the top four because it really is, uh, in recent years, been the favored safe haven. Uh, it's been the currency everybody's gone to because it's backed by gold. And it is, um, obviously, it, it is the favored safe haven when the Forex market is really allowed to choose. Right now, it's not allowed to choose because the um, it's kind of a wait and see with the, the Swiss National Bank and see how much it's going to intervene there. Um, we'll go to the next four currencies, um, primarily commodity currencies, and I have the UK in there simply because it's an oil, um, it, it's an oil uh, rich country. At least they, they take care of themselves with their own oil and don't have to go outside. Australia for its natural minerals, and um, Canada for its oil, and uh, New Zealand, along with Canada uh, or along with Australia, is powering the uh, the explosion in Japan, Japan of their expansion uh, with all of their natural minerals and oils. Okay, let's start with the U.S. dollar. It's like the prime world currency. Um, you can see we have um, 
15 um, trillion dollars uh, in gross domestic product. Now there were multiple places and I do cite the CIA World Factbook um, and also um, I'll quote some stats from the uh, Bank of International um, Settlements as well. Uh, purchasing power per capita. Very interesting changes over the last few years because the USA was always all, number one. But um, recently countries like Qatar have taken over and, and you can see that the U.S. has been pushed down to number nine. And um, if you're not familiar with this term, it basically, uh, if all things being equal, how much stuff can you buy? They have something they call the Big Mac Index. So how many Big Macs could you buy? Um, in in that country, so economic strength, manufacturing, and services together equate to about seventy eight, seventy nine percent. And the weaknesses, of course, we're, we're pretty dependent on oil. We use about twenty five percent of the world's oil. Um, and uh, one of our other weaknesses, as you can see, is our gross external debt is almost equal to our GDP. Not a good stat. Certainly not something we're very proud of. Uh, uh, definitely one of the bigger issues that we've got. Um, again, it is um, our prime import partners. 20% of the exports coming down to China, and this, the, of course the world's largest exporter, 20% of that is coming to the United States. Um, in, uh, obviously 55% of our oil comes from Canada, uh, 30% um, comes from uh, Saudi Arabia, but 55% from Canada. And obviously, we take a lot from Mexico as well. Okay, the European Union, it is the largest economy. 17, there's 27 member states, but only 17 use the euro. Uh, $16 trillion uh, in their GDP. Um, obviously, um, one of their um, strengths is manufacturing and services. It's primarily a service economy right now. Um, oil dependency. Um, is a big deal. Uh, it's the primary difference between um, the Eurozone and the uh, UK or the, the gr uh, Great British Pound. Um, fiscal health of each member state, obviously it's taken a beating because of the um, debt um, issues in um, uh, several of the states over there, the economies. Um, and uh, largest member, 25% of its GDP went basically uh, Germany really kind of drives it in supporting and, and paying off a lot of this debt. And um, one interesting point here, we look at this, whereas the U.S. is the prime world currency, and uh, very often the, the Forex is actually a game of uh, USD against the world. Uh, Euro um, is referred to as the anti-dollar because it will go directly opposite of the um, U.S. dollar. Okay, we have the GDP uh, for Japan. Obviously, uh, Japan is uh, so, uh, Japan's biggest um, growth spurt has to do with it being a weak currency. Um, it is a primary exporter. It thrives. It survives, and it thrives because people in Europe and people in um, the U.S. buy cars and buy uh, electronics. And so um, one of the things that you'll see, when you fo if you follow the equities, particularly in the United States, when the Dow falls or the S&P falls, the yen will react um, in a much stronger fashion than even the U.S. dollar because it is a direct impact on their currency. And it is a um, major exporter. Again, it survived the recent events of tsunami, the nuclear situation over there really created a problem. Um, and first time, uh, certainly, that I could uh, identify where uh, all of the major economies in the world were actually in there supporting uh, Japan and, and helping them to intervene in the forex market and, and to push that currency down. So it's obviously a big deal. Um, just this um, year, China surpassed Japan as the second the single largest economy in the world. Okay, um, China, don't, not a lot of people trade, uh, are able to trade the Chinese win, um, but um, I look at uh, the, this currency, this economy as a game changer. It is, um, you know, like it or not, uh, that currency is fixed, 
and that makes it very difficult and, and makes it um, problematic for the rest of the world um, and, and certainly for the 4X. And you'll see when we start to line up the currencies that this really is a game changer and can disrupt the, the normal flow of the market. Um, some great stats here, almost $6 trillion in their gross domestic product. Their, um, it, I found it very interesting that, you know, we hear a lot about the Chinese war chest. And it's like, how big is that war chest? In July, it was 3.2 trillion, uh, US dollars. That's, um, in, in, that's astronomical. Um, they're, they're good to go and they are expanding all over the place. And I think they're going to be, uh, they're expected by 2020 or 2030 to overtake and, and become the largest economy in the world. They are, um, of note, the largest creditor in the world. And they are also, um, I found interesting, in addition to manufacturing, they have 300 million Chinese workers in the agricultural industry. So basically they are feeding a, a very large par- portion of this world. And so when we have agricultural issues coming out of Japan, it, in fact, it impacts stock markets in a lot of places because of some of the agricultural giants that are um, importing those uh that those goods. The Great British Pound from the UK Kingdom, the United Kingdom. Now the UK is actually a member of the um, Eurozone. It's not does not participate um, with the Euro. One of the biggest differences I see between the UK and the Eurozone is the fact that the, the UK UK has its own oil. Doesn't produce a lot but it produces enough to support itself. So it's not, it doesn't have the oil dependency that you see showing up um, with all of the other economies. And that means that it drives a little different. It's, it's certainly a parallel currency to the, um, to the euro, but it is not as tied to it as, say, the Swiss fee. It's the sixth largest economy, third in Europe, but it is um, the largest financial center. Whereas we have about 150 um, billion traded in the forex out of the U.S., uh, London does about 370. I mean that it, it is huge when it comes. It is definitely the foreign exchange capital of the world. Okay, Canada, small, um, not that big of an economy. Um, it's certainly bigger than many, many others, but compared to the U.S. and, and the Eurozone, it's, it's fairly small. Number 16 in um, purchasing power per capita, it is um, an oil exporter. And therefore, that separates it a bit from the U.S. Um, because of that oil, the current when um, U.S. stocks rise on oil prices, so will can- the Canadian dollar for the most part. Um, whereas um, the U.S. dollar uh, will struggle with that, um, and that you see a separation there. And it is obviously it's dependent on the United States. I mean, where there's such a huge trade relationship there, that if we falter, they will falter um, as well. Eventually, at some point, Canada is going to follow U.S. because of that regional trade um, situation. Service industry, 75% of Canadians are in some type of service, um, but uh, of note, its debt burden is the lowest in the G8. And, and that's something definitely um, that they're very proud of in Canada and um, one of our biggest investors here in the U.S. Switzerland, just over half a trillion dollars in um, their gross domestic product, which doesn't seem like much at all. But they are the World Banking Center, and they're the gold standard. And um, it's they're very closely linked, gold and the Swissies. When you see gold rise, you should see the Swissie rise. And it's very interesting to watch what happens when the S&D is um, intervening in the market um, and pushing their currency down. Uh, But with the rise of gold, 
it'll be interesting to see if they can keep it pushed down because it's so closely tied to gold that unless they break that bond, uh, the Swissie's just going to strain at the seams there. And obviously in the oil dependency, it is not a member of the Eurozone. Um, it is definitely the safe haven of choice recently. There are um, basically three safe havens, the U.S. dollar, the Japanese yen, and the Swissy. And uh, basically in the past year, what I've watched up until um, the extreme intervention was that uh, basically the safe haven choice, it was basically the Swiss haven was making, or the Swissy was making the, the decision. It was choosing to be the safe haven, um, and it was there, it was theirs for the taking. If it wasn't, uh, it was almost like the Swissy was uh, just making a decision not to be. So it, it was definitely the one the world was choosing. Um, and obviously, there's there's lots of money in in Switzerland, and that's going to put it in good stead for a long, long time. Twenty eight percent of the funds across the world that are held outside of uh, the country of residence uh, of the um, owner of those currencies are held in Swiss banks. That's pretty extraordinary. New Zealand is um, the next currency, obviously a very small um, economy. It's um, commodities. And I put um, both New Zealand and Australia on this list simply because they are the currencies um, or they are the economies that are fueling the Chinese expansion. Uh, their exports of uh, natural resources or um, steel, copper, um, to China have really um, fueled that expansion up there, and it has made a big difference. They're highly traded currencies. Uh, for as small as this uh, economy is, it's the 10th largest uh, currency that's traded. And um, it's it's very easy to do business there. Uh, consistently, every year, uh, ranked at the very top of the ease of doing business uh, channel. And... Um, but the past year has been really tough. If you notice, when this economy, when the world economy started faltering, Australia and New Zealand were, were holding up pretty well um, because of that uh, connection to China. But the past year, um, seeing both of them struggle just a little bit, um, in New Zealand particularly, six major earthquakes just since um, early in the year. Three of them happen one right after another in July. And you can see, uh, you know, whether that was the, the final impact or not. In That happened in July. In August and September, we saw this currency take a serious dip. Now, so did Australia, but Australia dropped about 450 pips. New Zealand currency uh, dropped about uh, over 1,200 pips. So, I mean, it, it was hit hard uh, this past couple of months. And we have Australia, which is, of course, the currency that is truly, or economy that is truly powered. Uh, China and made a huge difference um, to that economy to, because where China struggles, you will see Australia take a dip. If you see good news out of China, Australia uh, does well as a possible. So there's a clear connection there. It, um, also, uh, AAA-rated banks in the world, there's nine of them. Four of those exist in, um, or reside in uh, Australia and um, is very rich in national natural resources. Okay, so we're going to pull all of this together here. The currencies are established or are grouped together in two major families. One of those is really presided over by the U.S. dollar and the other one, by the euro. USD um, is the prime world currency, and it's going to continue to be that way for a, for a long time. I mean, I don't, uh, not that it deserves to be. I'm a, an American, but I recognize our debt problems. But it is. It's there. It's in. It's residing. Uh, U.S. dollars reside in basically every major economy. They're collecting them uh, because uh, for whatever reason, uh, China has a lot of it. Japan and China own a lot of U.S. debt and a lot of currency reserves. So um, it's going to continue to be the prime world currency, whereas the euro is the anti-dollar. Um, the anti -dollar. 
and you will see when uh, the currency market is being characterized by the media, they're almost always, or by analysts, they will evaluate the dollar against the yen or the dollar against the euro, and that really kind of um, pulls it all together. So each of these currencies, they are polar opposites to each other. If you see uh, oil rise and the stocks um, drive up as a result of that, you will see um, the euro dollar will actually rise. So the U.S. dollar drops, the euro um, increases. As that. So there's, there's a give and take there, and they, you can see the correlation. Now, each of these currencies has a sister currency. If you look at the dollar or the euro dollar and the um, dollar Swissy, um, those two currencies are um, inverse currencies, and they will, um, with some exceptions, particularly recently with some of the problems, they tend to pull each other after um, them. And so, if one is is strong, it will pull up the other one, um, and you will see those. Um, Currency charts look very, very similar to each other. And we do a whole class on, on basically on those two currencies and how you can uh, evaluate how those two are traveling against each other. The um, dollar and the yen are also sister currencies. I would have thought it was the Canadian, but that difference in oil uh, made a huge difference. Plus, Japan, as I said, survives and thrives because of much of the purchasing that occurs in the United States of automobiles and electronics and various other things that they export. And so that Japanese yen is more a bellwether of the um, uh, of what's happening in the um, U.S. stock markets and the equities, um, sometimes more so than the U.S. dollar. Okay. Um, the, each of these currencies, the euro and the dollar, both have also cousins. They're not as closely tied. Um, they'll be somewhat um, separated, but and uh, the Great British Pound, um, and and I, I think it's very interesting to note the difference uh, between the cousins and the sisters uh, here. The biggest difference that seems to jump out at me is the the availability of oil in that country. So you have the Canadian dollar that is the cousin to the U.S. dollar. It will follow the dollar eventually, but um, some oil will drive it a little separate. Um, and the same with the Great British Pound. It is um, tied to the euro dollar, but not as tightly as the Swissie. Then you have a couple other. You see Australia and New Zealand are kind of like distant cousins. They will follow, but their connection primarily is to uh, China these days and um they're very loyal to that. So they're a little bit distant cousins. They're not related to the U.S. dollar much at all. So then you have here um, the game changer. You have China that's a cousin to both the euro and to um, the, the Japanese yen. And what happens is that uh, as closely as tied as the Japanese yen is to the U.S. dollar, Japan is also the de facto representative of China. So when the Chinese economy fluctuates up or down, uh, it's certainly when it happens as a, it's a surprise or it's unexpected, um, you will see it reflected and traded in the Forex via the Japanese yen. And so you will see uh, it. the Japanese yen do things that you don't normally expect it to do because it's representing China. And then, okay, so there we go. So we're going to go back and we'll just look at the U.S. dollar, Eurozone, Japan, Switzerland, Australia, the U.K., Canada, New Zealand, and, of course, the game changer of China. Whether you trade it or not, um, it's out there and it's making a difference, and you have to follow it. You need to understand um, if you're trading the Forex, you need to know the equity. I, uh, I spend more time studying the equities and studying um, than, uh, than I do actually the Forex chart. So I will study the equity charts before I make a trade. We've got three major currency groups. Obviously, we group them um, majors or any pair that contains the U.S. dollar, 
The yen crosses any pair containing the Japanese yen, except the dollar yen, which is a major. And you will, actually, there are many, many classes that we have on the Japanese yen, um, and particularly the dollar, the U.S. dollar, Japanese yen, uh, because it, it really can up in the market and draw and show when, when there is chaos in the market or something, some fear has set in, risk is off, it is the dollar yen that really starts to lead the way and signals what's happening. And then finally, the exotics, um, it's any pair that doesn't contain the other two. We've got the two currency families, which we discussed, uh, driven by the euro, driven by the dollar, and then the bellwethers. These currencies we can we look at as the superpowers, and um, the euro dollar. You obviously you see it a lot. It's evaluated in the market. It has 28 percent of the market liquidity. That's out of the uh, BIS, BIS report. Um, the dollar yen takes charge when um, fear upheavals, risk is off, uh, drives reversals. Um, and it, it is the one that signals that the reversal is coming. If you're looking to see any kind of bellwether or uh, something that's an indicator that the market's going to upend, the dollar yen is the one that's primarily going to tell you that. And the euro yen um, really closes the loop between those three economies. And that's one of the other uh, currency pairs that uh, em measurements that is evaluated and reported uh, quite often out in the media. So let's take a look at some of these relationships, these trade relationships. Okay. And we have, um, as you can see here, strong trade, re these are the strongest trade relationships. You see there's a very strong one between Canada and the U.S., a cousin's there. Then you have the U.S. To, Ch to Japan and the U.S. to China. And you don't really see that close a tie to any other um, world economy. You see, obviously, in between regional trade in here between the Eurozone and uh, Switzerland, uh, the U.K. is very strong. And then Europe to China is obviously big, and Europe to Japan. So there there are those trade ones. Um, and then you have, of course, China to Japan is a very strong, which is what makes Japan the de facto representative for China in these currencies. And then you will see that uh, the link between uh, Australia and New Zealand up to Japan, up to China. Okay, I'm going to stop here and take a look. Do we have any questions? Let's see. You know, any brothers? No, they don't have any brothers. I don't know who decided currencies were sisters, but um, that is the case here. Okay, any questions here? Uh, the question, is it recording? My understanding is, yes, that it is being recorded. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, and... All right, then what I'm going to do here is go to um, the next slide, which talks about next week's um, class. Mayor Bonferru will be um, leading that. Hopefully you got a chance to listen to him uh, last week. And um, he is going to continue with the market review chart reading and technical analysis. This week was about fundamentals, and we um, really try to combine both fundamentals and technicals for a holistic um, trading uh, success. Um, really need to be both. 
And so he is going to be looking at um, support, uh, multiple time frame analysis, support and resistance, and Fibonacci levels. Now, we do a lot more technical analysis. These are the three that he's going to talk about um, and then um, how to use those simple tools. Now, the other thing that I am going to do um, is talk just a little bit about a couple minutes about the um, uh, Thousand Pip Club. We have um, over 50 core concepts that we teach, and they range from what you saw today, which is the currency neighborhood, up to talking about the superpowers, talking about key support and resistance, uh, various trade uh, trading strategies, entries. Um, the, there is quite a few, quite a bit of education there. Somewhere around 300 hours of video, uh, about 100 um, documents to review, and um, what we refer to as core concept videos. Um, very interesting class, and I believe that is okay. The, the mod says we're recording. You'll find the video in our archives tomorrow. Um, excellent. Thank you. And here. And you can see uh, much of what we offer here. Okay. Um, that is no more questions. Um, I think that we are complete. Thank you um, very much. And, oh, you want to see the, the slide again on the uh, Great British Pound. Okay. Like you said, if you missed any of this, if you were writing it down, um, you can uh, review this um, on the, the video tomorrow once it's posted. Okay. Okay. And um, thank you very much. And I believe that we are done for the day. And we will see you back here hopefully next Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time in the U.S.